Welcome to today's webinar on multifamily design in Type 5, Type 3 podium versus Type 1 high-rise construction. The webinar is brought to you by the groups you see listed below, Open Architecture Collaborative, the AIA's Housing Knowledge Community, and EDI International. I'm Steve Schreiber, and I am the moderator for today's webinar, for which those of you that are seeking AIA credits will earn one AIA learning unit. But more importantly, today's presenter is Simon Ha, who is a partner and urban mixed use practice leader at Steinberg in LA, and he's chair of the National AIA's Housing Knowledge Community, past chair for the Downtown LA Neighborhood Council's Planning and Land Use Committee, and a member of RECODE LA Zoning Advisory Committee, the LA Department of City Planning. The learning objectives for today's webinar are listed below. You will understand, or Simon will, will uh, describe the design challenges and opportunities in designing high density housing and podium and high rise construction. He'll describe the economics of producing high density housing and podium and high rise construction. He'll discuss the potential policies that may impact housing production, and he'll describe the basics of multifamily real estate development. The overall course description is listed below. You'll learn the design, economic, and policy issues in high-density multifamily housing design in podium construction and high-rise construction. Logistics, uh, we actively seek your questions during the presentation. And the way that this works is you'll enter your questions into the chat box, which you'll, you'll see a description of that off to the right. So any content-related questions will be answered during the question and answer towards the end. If there are technical questions, those, we'll try to deal with those during the webinar. This is the uh, information regarding the copyright. and some information regarding compliance. I'll give a moment for you to read this. So with no further ado, um, please join me in welcoming Simon Ha. Hey, Simon, we're not actually able to hear you. How about now? Perfect. Thank you. Okay. I had myself on mute. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, great. All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Um, I'm going to be using a Los Angeles, Los Angeles as an example of um, the issues that we're having in terms of multifamily design. Uh, medium to high density, and typically done in wood over concrete, uh, which is called podium. And I'll describe the issues that we're, we've been having here in terms of uh, design issues or policy issues or economic issues that we've been having um, through the lens of development, developments in L.A. Okay, um, so you've seen a lot of these probably go in uh, near you in your city or in more of an urban, suburban urban areas where you have a concrete podium, it may have retail on the ground floor, underground parking or above grade parking, and four to five stories of wood structure above. Um, and then you understand, um, I assume, a high-rise construction, which is all done in type 1, steel and concrete. So these are some of the examples that we see 
in downtown LA. And I think in many of our growing cities, uh, there has been a proliferation of medium to high density housing production. Um, the form of the new housing is typically five to seven stories with a mix of concrete and uh, wood construction, uh, what we call podium. And I'll refer to during the uh, webinar, I'll refer to these types of housing as podium housing or podium construction. So in LA, a debate emerged um, as the city and community started to express concerns about this new housing type. And there were some policies aimed towards prohibiting podium construction uh, in downtown LA. So going back a little bit, downtown LA has been um, primarily a, a central business district um, since the advent of automobiles and uh, when freeways uh, went in and there was a suburban flight from downtown. In 1999, Los Angeles passed an ordinance called Adaptive Reuse Ordinance. What that did was it made it easier for older buildings in downtown LA to be converted into lofts. And you've seen this in many different cities. Uh, so from 1999, we had the, uh, the housing boom, um, I think, which uh, essentially led to the downfall in 2008 into a big economic depression. So what I'm showing on the left is a project that was being proposed in 2007 at the height of the housing boom, the previous housing boom. Um, if you look at the if you look at the buildings that it's on the right hand corner, those are the same buildings and the high rises on the left, the two high rises, uh, which was 70 stories and 40 stories, that was being proposed on that site. In 2014, after the recession, um, the resulting project that, that is actually getting built today was more of a mid-rise uh, next to the historic building on the corner. And then you can see a, a seven-story building behind uh, the corner building, which goes to show you after the last cycle and the downturn, when we came back, we weren't seeing a lot of these large projects coming in um, because of, I think, tightening regulations on funding. Um, and also consumer confidence. Um, you know, we were just starting to come out of the recession here. Here's another example of a building um, on the same site in 2007. Daniel Leapskin proposed a high-rise condominium building. This is right across the street from the LA Convention Center in downtown. And on the right is one of the first buildings that went into construction after the recession. And on the same site, this is what we ended up getting on Figueroa, which is one of our main corridors uh, where LA Live and LA Convention Center is. And this wasn't just isolated to uh, LA. And you know, Portland, this is um, South Waterfront District. And in 2007, there was a master plan that was done. and you can see the type of housing that was being proposed. And this is what's actually happening. So in 2007, there was a number of high rises, or during the last cycle, number of high rises went up. And in 2017, I just pulled this out of a newspaper. Um, this is what's being approved now. And it, this is mostly seven story podium construction. So, you know, why is this happening? And I think I'm going to answer some of those questions on why uh, are we not building high rises? Why are, why are all the housing types uh, mostly being built out of podium? Uh, learning objective, uh, Stephen went through it, so I'm going to skip this. Really, you know, the main goal is to, at a basic level, describe uh, the issues that we have economically and also um, 
also policy-wise, um, why we're getting so many of these podium structures. So a little bit about me. Um, so I've been doing housing for close to about 17 years, mostly multifamily in urban infill in redeveloping uh, downtowns. And my company Steinberg, Steinberg is 62 years old, uh, came out of Silicon Valley, and we do a variety of uh, different project types. Um, but four main sectors, which is multifamily, urban infill, um, and hospitality, it, uh, and we label that as urban mixed use. Uh, we have higher education, we do a lot of student housing and university facilities. Uh, commercial interiors, and then civic. So we have a lot of experience doing all types of housing. Currently in LA, uh, we have probably about half and half of podium and high rise. So why the shift from high rise to podium housing? So out of the recession in 2012, uh, may, let me back up a little bit. In 2007, uh, we started to see uh, developers not moving forward with, um, you know, starting projects in concept design. And what had happened was the price, the prices of land has gotten to a point where um, they couldn't really afford to buy the land and start to start the projects. And I think we started to see um, that projects were starting to slow down. And 2008, the downturn happened, and a lot of my clients, um, you know, they, they went down to either one project during the re uh, recession or they closed their shop altogether. And um, we were lucky enough to have few of those projects that were ongoing to keep us busy. But to give you an example, one of our clients had 13 projects in 2007. After 2008, they canceled all the projects except for one. And they timed the delivery of those apartments. It was 480 units of apartments in, uh, in Miracle Mile of Los Angeles. And they timed it to deliver the products in 2013, uh, thinking that that's, that's when jobs were going to come back and that's when people were going to be able to start um, looking for new housing again, which meant that we didn't really start uh, restart the project until 2011. And we had a number of those projects where developers were really timing their delivery in 2012-2013. Around the same time, um, City of LA started allowing a code modifications to allow two stories of concrete over uh, on uh, above grade, and then five stories of type three on top. Per the code in 2013, 2010, 2013, that wasn't allowed. You were only allowed one a story max above grade. Um, but when the city of LA started to allow code modifications to get an extra level, that really made it possible for a lot of these podium projects to pencil. And uh, pencil meaning that it was economically viable, that they can package the uh, um, the financials, the performa, and go out to the investors, and investors were willing to uh, invest in the projects. And that's important because there wasn't a lot of money out there. There was, there was not a whole lot of confidence that without creating new jobs or bringing jobs back, that new housing was, um, there were, there were going to be people that were going into the new housing. So this, you know, this modification may seem small, but it was huge in terms of allowing um, 
the projects to get more units, one level of additional units, which made it made it financially viable for the projects to be economically viable for to their investors. In 2016, uh, the two stories above grade um, is allowed by right. Um, in 2013 and 2010, uh, City of LA uh, Building and Safety they were allowing the modifications because IBC already allowed it, and some of the other states were uh, were already implementing that. And also, they they saw that in 2016 that LA was going to allow uh, multiple levels of concrete over o above grade. So here's a section showing what a seven-story podium building looks like. Typically, um, underground parking, because you're limited in height, you can, all, you can only go up to 85 feet from grade or uh, grade point to grade plane, I'm sorry, to average height of the roof. So here you see the first and second floor, first floor being retail, leasing, uh, garage entry. You may have some ground floor units, and then second floor of units, but these units are in concrete type one. Above the red line is the five stories of type three uh, wood, light wood construction. Here's a site plan showing that um, the project in the section. So you started to see these a lot. It either comes in a form of an S, E, or a O, and um, it's all based on a module, typically 33-foot unit, 6-foot corridor, 33-foot unit. So it's a 72-unit, 72-foot uh, wide building module, and it kind of snakes around the site in order to create the courtyards. Here's an aerial showing downtown L.A., and you can see downtown LA has a lot of parking lots. And a lot of the buildings, because of the earthquakes, a lot of the older historic buildings have been demolished and turned into parking lots. So the first part of the downtown LA Renaissance really was to reuse the buildings that were there. And then there were a few buildings that were ground up at the end of 2007, 2008. Um, and starting in 2012, we started to see a lot of ground up because all the historic buildings were taken up. So here's an aerial looking at this similar area. So the four green parcels and the three red parcels, those are all being filled in with housing. And the four green parcels are these four buildings. Some are better designed than others. I think there is a lot of debate in downtown. Uh, there is a Facebook group called Downtown Development or DTLA Development where a lot of discussions happen. And around Los Angeles, we were seeing these types of podium buildings everywhere. And people were getting concerned um, because typically they're the exterior material is stucco. Uh, they typically fill out the entire footprint of the site. So they started calling calling these types of buildings um, seven-story stucco boxes or um, stumpies is another um, nickname that th these types of buildings were getting. And there was a lot of concern about uh, the aesthetics and the quality of these buildings. So to capture the sentiments of the public, um, Downtown News had an article called Why Are So Many Downtown's New Housing Complexes So Ugly? And one of the extra out of there is not every building can be a landmark, of course. 
but as downtown Los Angeles is in the midst of a development boom that will see numerous parking lots replaced by residential and other projects, one of the most frequently asked questions is, why is the crush of mid-rise residential buildings so unspectacular? Um, Urbanized LA is a blog site that covers pretty much every single development project that happens in LA. Um, here's another heading uh, saying another low-rise apartment building headed to South Park, kind of with a negative connotation that uh, we don't want these low-rise buildings anymore. So this site actually is directly across from the LA Convention Center. You can see at the end of the road a Staples Center, and the background is the financial district. So these are uh, these were thought to be key real estate uh, sites and prominent sites. Here's a building that's going in between the two. You see the red arrow. So this is a project that's being proposed there. Again. Um, essentially a stucco box with some articulation or additive design features. Here's another one in the fashion district. And here's another one by the same developer. Uh, this was part of the unified development. And this caused a lot of um, a lot of complaints and a lot of people asking, well, why can't they build high rise? Uh, why are they building? Why are the developers opting to build podium projects and not build high rise in downtown LA? So the next part, um, I'm going to go through a development of a Type Three versus a Type One on the same site. So this is a recent study that we did. Typically when a client comes to us, they want to figure out what they can build on the site. And depending on how much they're paying for the site, they have an idea of whether or not a seven-story building can work or a high-rise building can work. Um, a lot of times we'll do the studies and show them both. And initially go through the process of the yield study to show them what you would get if you do a type 3 podium on the site and what you would get if you if you did a high rise so on this site we looked at two different options and many sites nowadays uh, we look at we look at both options so I'm going to go through a quick um, kind of a basic level calculation on uh, construction costs and the value of the property, what kind of rent that you would have to get to be able to afford a building like that. Um, so this first slide is looking at two different yields. One gets, the podium gets 168 units and the high rise gets 251 units. Construction costs right now um, for a type 3 building is running roughly around 400 square feet uh, per net rentable. And for a high rise, it's, it's about a third higher at $600 a square foot. So you can quickly add, estimate what the hard cost is going to be based on uh, number of units, average uh, unit size. That gets us in the podium 105 thousand square feet of rentable area and then in the high-rise we get 161,391 square feet so that comes down to a, a construction cost of 42 million versus 96 million um, okay and this next slide shows you um, the overall, so we looked at the hard cost of what it's going to take to build it, just the construction cost. Now we're adding in the soft cost and the land cost to see how much it's going to cost to produce one unit of housing. So you can see between the 
podium and the high rise, um, it's it's a significant cost difference. You know, we end up at four hundred five thousand dollars per unit versus five hundred fifty four thousand and change for the high rise. And look at the land cost here. Land cost for for this site it was uh, marketed at a certain price. A lot of times what the landowners will do is put out an RFP and let the uh, let let the developers propose how much they can pay for the land. So if you look at the land cost, the land cost is going to be the same whether you build a high rise or a podium. Um, but if you can build more, your land cost goes down. But in Type One, your construction cost is going to be much higher. So your total production cost for a podium is just over 400,000 versus just over 550,000 for the high rise. So taking that number, now we can look at the total cost of the building. We're looking at a $68 million building or a $139 million building. And in order for um, in order for you to get some profit and have your value um, of the building equal to the total cost of the building, uh, we look at a um, we look at a formula which is the value equals net operating income over cap rate. Cap rate is something that is um, set or agreed upon in, by the real estate community for a certain area. So cap rate is low when there's a lot of competition. It's an A um, neighborhood with a great site. They would go down on the cap rate because you know they they anticipate the value later on may go up or they're they're willing to be in a hot market and take a less uh, profit so looking at this the podium uh, maybe I should go in the second line which is you try to figure out what your net operating income is going to be so Gross income, we're estimating that you would have to charge $3.25 per square foot in the podium versus in the high rise, you would have to charge the rent of $4.33 a square foot for the project to pencil. So it's a pretty big difference. And what that means is you're producing a housing product that is. Um, that's going to be $2,275 per month for a 700 square foot one bedroom or over $3,000 per month. So when a, uh, when a developer is looking at the site, they're looking to see, okay, how much can I charge? How much is it going to cost for me to build this thing? And what's the degree of confidence that people, the consumers, are going to be able to pay the rent? So early on, uh, coming out of the recession in 20, uh, 2012, 2013, not a lot of people had confidence that pe there were a lot of people that can afford three, over $3,000 per month for a one-bedroom versus uh, $2,275. So, Developers went with a less riskier uh, project because you can find more people that can afford 2275 versus over 3000 And the investors were feeling the same. Um, they were risk averse after the downturn. So they were betting on the fact that people can afford to afford the lower rent and not go the luxury. And there is there is a higher risk involved with the high rise. So the next part is how does land price relate to development costs? So what happened in downtown was there was a ton of podium buildings that were being built, and then all of a sudden the land prices started to go up, and podium builders could not afford to buy the land at that price anymore, 
and most of the projects that are being proposed now are are high rise. Um, I recently wrote an article called "The Perfect Storm of Housing Affordability," and that and this was a sequel to an article I wrote maybe about a year and a half ago, talking about housing affordability issues, rising construction costs, um, rising housing prices, and looking at other policy factors that were raising park fees and linkage fees for affordable housing, and all of these things coming together to uh, negatively impact housing production. As part of that, I was looking at the land value in downtown LA. So in 2012, um, I'm looking at, at the same area in South Park, and these are like three blocks, within three blocks. And in 20, 2012, uh, there was a large site that was sold for $221 per square foot. In the similar area, uh, so one street over, I mean, it was literally across the street in 2015, uh, we saw a sale of $585 per square foot of land. And uh, just recently, another pr another uh, site was purchased for $893 per square foot. So you're looking at like a 400% increase from 2012 when we're coming out of the recession. So let's take a look at what happens if we use the same project that um, we used as a case study before and double the land cost. So everything staying the same, um, construction cost staying the same, land cost doubling, you can see that uh, the land cost is going to $160,000 per unit for the podium because you have less unit. For the high rise, uh, you're getting 107,000 and change uh, per unit for land cost, and these are these are pretty high. I think the sweet spot for um, high-rise. A lot of the developers are telling me now that they can't pay more than $80,000, uh, looking at all the fees and construction costs of today. Um, they just can't make the deal pencil. For the podium, you're probably looking at about $100,000. So this really kicks it up, um, kicks up the uh, rent required, you know, the uh, what you have to charge the consumers to be able to um, produce the product and have some uh, profit. So in a podium, you go from a two thousand two hundred seventy-five dollars uh, to twenty-seven twenty-three for the same one bedroom. So that's about a 20% increase. In the high rise, uh, that increase is from 3,031 to 3,318. So just under 10%. So when uh, when the uh, the land prices start to go up, it makes it less economical for a podium product to uh, to be viable, economically viable. So out of all of that, um, out of the, the newspaper article that came out in downtown news, and that was kind of the sentiment of, of, the, uh, of the community, there was a knee-jerk uh, reaction policy that came out of, of the council office who uh, oversees downtown LA. And people started asking, why can't all buildings be high-rise? Or, you know, all these little the stumpies are coming into downtown taking up valuable land, we need to preserve the land for high-rise buildings and hotels in this area. Um, so here's a newspaper article talking about Councilman Huizar motioning um, to prohibit low-rise buildings in parts of downtown. And the parts of downtown is, if you look at the map on the right, um, the blue, the, the turquoise and uh, the teal. So that's the LA Live Staples Center and um, Convention Center. So they came up with this idea of, hey, let's preserve the land in this area because 
we're seeing a lot of these podium projects going in and we don't like it. We don't like the way they look. We don't like the fact that these seem like they're low quality buildings. Uh, at the same time, in different in different cities, uh, these uh, structures were going up in fire in San Francisco and in New Jersey. So there was a growing concern and um, and out of that was uh, this prohibition and it was in zone one um, you you couldn't build podium projects in zone two you can build podium projects only if you're building a high-rise as part of your uh, your project so what's wrong with um, pro, you know prohibiting uh, the podium or the cheaper type of housing um, I I always compare housing to cars because that, I think everyone, um, not everyone needs one, but for the most part, people have cars. And you have a choice between whether you can afford a, uh, like a Honda, a Civic, or, um, or something in that price point versus somebody who can afford a luxury product. And my argument back to the council office and the city was that you know we need housing at all different price points you can't create a community where only the expensive housing can exist because that's a policy to create inequity um, another argument or talking point was that we were starting to see a lot of high-rises being built in downtown with a parking podium and on the right hand side um, you see what it does to the street there is a little bit of commercial on the ground floor but you're taking away eyes on the street um, oftentimes these are not very attractive so these caused a lot of controversy on on the podium side, what's nice about it is because you're limited in height, you're forced to put your parking underground or behind the storefront. So it provides eyes on the street just above uh, the retail level and it creates a better urban design. So uh, prohibiting podium buildings and only building high rises would create higher density housing, more luxury housing, but it'll be detrimental for the uh, the street life. And we argue that the variety of tall buildings and short buildings and you know wide buildings and narrow buildings, it all adds to the uh, the character of the neighborhood in downtown LA. And this is a collage. I'll show you two collages of the type of buildings that are existing or being planned or already built in downtown um, in the same lo same vicinity as where the moratorium uh, was going to be forced. So you can see it's a variety of mid-rise, high-rise. You know, I, I would I would agree that some uh, podium buildings are being uh, designed very cheap and uh, that there needs to be better kind of design control but if you look at the variety of housing that's coming in um, if you had all high-rises with parking podiums it would be detrimental to downtown LA I think having a mixture um, is better uh, the parking podiums have become a huge issue in downtown, uh, Planning Commission has put out a memo saying um, the development should look at undergrounding the parking first and go through a list of um, design measures if it's going to be above grade. Uh, downtown currently allows three exposed parking levels. Anything above three levels uh, would have to be wrapped with an active use. San Diego has a, 
a similar policy, but in San Diego you have to go down three levels before you can go above grade. So the city is not prohibiting it, but setting a policy to say above grade parking is not the best for our city. So the developer will have to go down three levels before they can go up and um, and put a parking podium uh, above grade. So some of the pro prohibition impacts. So when the ICO came out, I explained a few of those things. Um, what it would have done was it would have slowed down housing production in downtown. There is a lot of housing being proposed. We were uh, in 2014 you know, really starting to gain the momentum of development and started to add housing and add residents to downtown LA. In 2014, our population in downtown was half a million during the day, but resident population was only 56,000. So we needed a lot more housing to get the jobs to housing balance uh, to a point where we can have a really, you know, walkable um, neighborhood that had enough of a critical mass to be able to support the local retail and not have to uh, rely on uh, the half million people that are here for jobs or tourists. Uh, number two, it would have decreased investor confidence, and this is. You know, developers come in. They want to. They want to see if the council or the city has an an are friendly to business, or they're going to be very difficult to deal with. So, at this time when we really needed housing, we needed to fill up these uh, empty parking lots and create more housing. Um, sending that signal from the politician to say we're going to put a stop to this development and next it could be for you know buildings that are less than 20 stories we're going to put a stop to that or buildings that are fat we're going to put a stop to that so this type of attitude of uh, an intervention is not good for the investor confidence um, number three, is, which I touched on, is only allowing high-rise housing with high rents would result in an exclusive neighborhood only for the high-income individual. And what we like about downtown is it, you have people at all level, all economic levels, um, all types of different people that are living in downtown, and it's that variety. Um, that I think makes downtown unique and creating a you know zone one and zone two to be this exclusive neighborhood where only people that can afford three thousand dollar rents can live in um, I thought was a bad policy and being on the neighborhood council and chairing the land use committee uh, we fought this uh, policy and um, and essentially kill the policy from moving forward. Uh, number four, it would have slowed the renaissance of DTLA. You know, urban growth is organic and it takes time. So I argued that, you know, you can't go from a, a, an area of parking lots and all of a sudden go to a high-rise neighborhood. You have to br start to bring people in, start to repair some of those open lots, start to put in cafes and restaurants and neighbors serving retail and create that momentum, build on the momentum to, um, to create a nicer neighborhood. You know, start a school and allow people to live there longer. Um, and when I moved to downtown in 2007, there were no restaurants, literally no restaurants open after 5 p.m. because uh, there just wasn't critical mass to support it. Now downtown has become a, a, a hot spot for nightlife. And in downtown LA currently we have over 11,000 units under construction and almost 30,000 units that are proposed. 
we're going through a community plan update. And um, by 2040, we anticipate that um, on top of what we have now, we're going to be adding another 125,000 people. We're at about 70,000. I think when all the, all the housing gets built that's under construction, we'll be at about 90,000. I doubt uh, all 30,000 that are being proposed will get built um, because of high land prices and, um, and construction costs. So going back to uh, the notion of why are podium buildings so ugly, um, I would argue that good design can be found in all building types, and good design does not have to be necessarily expensive. So I'm going to show you a couple of projects that we've done in podium, and then a couple of other examples that I think uh, really push the boundaries of uh, what a podium building can look like. So this is a housing project that we're doing in Hollywood. Uh, it's about to go into construction. Um, it's a boutique project, 86 units. And you can, te you can see the two uh, levels of podium and then the five levels of housing up top. This is a project under construction in the Arts District. Uh, it's 200, uh, 320 units of uh, artist lofts. This is a project uh, we're, we're finishing entitlements on, and uh, this is just west of downtown LA in a neighborhood called City West. Um, this is a project by Loja. Um, and this is a type five four story over podium uh, with a couple levels of underground parking. So this project it recently finished. It was built for about $190 a square foot gross, which roughly equates to about $380 a square foot net rentable. So the example that we looked at before and for the type three structure, we were looking at $400 a square foot. So you can make a stucco box look nice. Um, this is one of my favorites. This is a permanent supportive housing for the uh, for um, veteran homeless uh, homeless individuals, and this is by Brooks Scarpa. Just won all kinds of national awards. So. Um, in conclusion, I think there are various economic um, conditions that create a um, economic condition that creates a playing field where a lot of housing uh, can be built in high rise or is more appropriate to be in seven story or six story podium projects and a lot of issues that have come up regarding safety and design can be addressed through um, you know hiring great architects and working with great developers and I think um, the community the city and the development community have to all come together to up our game and make sure that what we're building these buildings will last 50 years so what we're building is make makes positive impact in our communities and our and our good housing that's going to last um, the lifetime of, uh, of uh, the project. So thank you very much and we'll open it up to Q&A. And thank you so much for that amazing presentation and the questions were coming in rapidly and uh, regrettably we only have about five minutes for questions and so what I would propose is that we'll send you all of the questions and then you if you can take your time to answer them as as you see fit and then we'll make the, the whole Q&A written down um, available to everyone who's registered for this webinar if that sounds like a if that sounds like a plan so so the first question is um, regarding form of ownership so uh, pretty much all of the case studies that you did assumed rentals so what about 
is there something about podium buildings versus high rises that may have a different form of ownership? So if someone was were proposing or was proposing condominiums in which the units would be individually owned, would that change your formulas or ways of thinking at all? Uh, yes, I think you know we've seen um, podium condominiums as well as high-rise condominiums. So the construction type is not uh, exclusive to uh, to the issues of apartments. Mm -hmm. I would say the issues are different in condominium. It's not really a um, it's I would say it's not really a question of whether land price or construction costs or construction type, but it's a question really of litigation and liability. Mm -hmm. So um, a lot of times when we build a a condominium out of wood, we would put a 20% premium on it to make sure that acoustic isolation and um, the stiffness of the floors so that it doesn't have the deflection and the creak, mm -hmm. um, those are the main issues and then the waterproofing. So you would spend probably about 20% more in terms of the quality of the building if the wood product was going to be a, a condominium. On the high-rise side, typically we build, because they were luxury, we build them to condo specs. But it really has to do with, as architects, protecting ourselves from a construction defect litigation, which in California is one of the largest issues. And a lot of the architecture firms won't take uh, condominium projects due to that, uh, due to the liability. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, so the question, there were some questions about the design that came in sort of early, and I think you answered it towards the end. But it makes, you know, makes me want to go back and look through all of that, you know, the AIA Housing Knowledge Communities Awards for multifamily housing, and, and sort of uh, figure out which ones may have been, you know, podium buildings, and which ones may have been other construction types. What about um, affordability? So also the models you were showing, just assume market rate rent on, you know, on um, all, for all of the units. But does, you, does uh, the areas for your case studies, is there any kind of an inclusionary zoning requirement? Or uh, currently is no. there? OK. Um, currently, there's no, uh, there was an inclusionary in one of the specific plans. Um, let me go back to, so this building here is in an area where they used to have inclusionary housing, but the one of the largest housing developers in the area sued the city and took it to um, the state Supreme Court. And the su state Supreme Court said the, f the way that they were requiring inclusionary was um, was not valid. So this, from that point on, the city could not require inclusionary housing. So right now, this, the, um, the mayor is pushing this thing called a linkage, affordable housing linkage fee, which would charge all building types, except for hospitals and a few others, um, either $5 a square foot for commercial or 12 to $15 a square foot for residential. Um, so that's coming in. In downtown LA, there's some incentives to require affordable housing, um, but there's also a, a program where you can buy additional floor area um, by paying a public benefits payment. And sometimes that goes towards affordable housing, and sometimes it does not. In California, um, out of the recession, Governor Jerry Brown uh, dismantle the community redevelopment agencies all across the uh, state. And um, CRA in downtown or in Los Angeles um, had about a $120 million uh, fund, and they used a lot of that to fund affordable housing. And when that got taken away, we really lost a mechanism to produce affordable housing. So. In LA now, um, we're starting to see 
the momentum on uh, trying to uh, trying to extract uh, some fees out of the developers, and there's a greater conversation going on about, you know, does everybody have to do their share in terms of providing affordable housing? Uh, one of the things, you know, uh, that happens with inclusionary housing is um, the idea is that over time the land value will adjust, and that's mm -hmm. the argument that's um, that's going on now. But that adjustment in the land price is not like next year, right? Yeah. It's more like 10, 20 years it'll eventually get there. But in the meantime, it's going to impact a lot of the projects because landowners are going to hold on to their land. They have no incentive to sell it now um, when people are trying to pay less than the guy, that, you know, your next door neighbor that sold it for, um, for a lot more. So people, landowners are going to hold their land and not sell it, uh, which means that there's going to be less uh, housing production available. And that's, and that's, that's a big discussion that's happening in L.A. right now. Interesting. Um, unfortunately, we really are out of time here because it's, it's two minutes before the hour. And I do have some closing remarks here. So there, there were many, many great questions that have come in. So some comments and some questions. So again, we'll send those to Simon, the presenter, and get him some time to look through them and answer as he sees fit. And if he's able to answer, we will send that to the registrant list, or the registration list. So my concluding remarks are, well, first of all, thank you very much. That was uh, a truly important and very thorough uh, presentation. Uh, this concludes this AIA continuing education course. There will be a webinar survey report that will be sent to the registrants in a follow-up email in the next hour. So please do that survey because that's also linked to your ability to get credit for this. Report credit for all attendees at your site by completing this webinar survey form by Friday of this week. So you have five days to do that. And please learn about other AIA web offerings at network.aia.org forward slash events forward slash webinars. And also follow us on social media. So thank you so much again to Simon and to Garrett Jacobs, who's working behind the scenes to, to uh, help us with this webinar. And we look forward to seeing you all in one month. So again, the first Monday of December, 12 noon Eastern time for the next of this webinar series. So thank you much to, once again, to Simon. Bye. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Garrett. And thanks everyone for uh, joining us this morning.